Get Technically Legal, where we examine the intersections of law, technology, and culture as we know it. Today, we have a very, very, very special guest, Mr. Chris Alexander. Chris Alexander is the director of the Office of Cannabis Management for New York State. Um, without further ado, how you doing, Chris? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. So so glad to be here with you, Josh. Man, we're, we're so happy to have you here, man. Um, got a lot to talk about today. Obviously, the topic of marijuana very interesting to everyone, just kind of seeing what the legalization looks like when you're when you're not doing it the legal way with some of the ramifications. But first off, we just want to know a little bit about your background. How did you get into this space? Um, is this something you knew you wanted to do since you were young or something that came all of a sudden? Um, but we just want the perspective as to like who you are um, and some background information. Yeah, no, no, I uh, definitely did not uh, see myself um, working for a decade on this issue, um, but it has been an interesting journey. I actually started my uh, professional career doing a lot of political organizing, uh, running political campaigns on the state, uh, local and federal levels. Um, eventually, I, I decided to you know, take up issue advocacy and really spend a lot of time working on um, bringing an end to stop and frisk here in New York City um, and the marijuana arrests that were resulting uh, from those interactions. Uh, and then eventually I ended up uh, building the statewide campaign to legalize, uh, running that campaign and drafting uh, the, what would be the most comprehensive and progressive legalization bill in the country, the MRTA, the Marijuana Regulation and Taxation Act. Um, went into the legislature, uh, uh, was in charge of criminal justice issues uh, for the state uh, you know, for, for, as a counsel in the New York State Senate. And then uh, came back in and got the call to now run uh, the agency and the industry um, that you know I designed. So that was a long uh, pathway, but it started really with me just taking an interest in uh, you know having a voice and, and giving a voice to people who, who oftentimes didn't have one. No, that's interesting. So uh, for many people, you, you you touched on how working through an agency, right? A lot of people don't know how work agencies work on behalf of the government, what it looks like. Could you take us a little bit into the mechanics of that and, and, and what you do on a day-to-day? -day? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, so, you know, in addition to uh, what people see kind of the public-facing thing, which is, uh, you know, the products themselves being you know, offered for sale, and, and uh, there is quite a bit in uh, running, engaged, involved in running a state agency. Uh, I am one of uh, a couple dozen commissioners. Um, there are um, our 60 or so state agencies, um, uh, you know, all offices that have a particular charge or mission. So State Department of Health, uh, Department of Tax and Finance, Department of Labor. These are all um, uh, other agencies in the state and they all have their own charges. Uh, for our agency, for OCM, uh, we are responsible for the regulation of the medical uh, cannabinoid hemp and adult use cannabis programs uh, in the state uh, for uh, the day to day. I mean, you know, we, we of course give out licenses and today's a special day because it is the opening of our general license application uh, window. Um, but what we also do is, you know, we kind of run a mini FDA, right? Like we ensure we license labs to do product testing. Uh, we review uh, the certificates of analysis from each uh, batch of, of cannabis products before they hit the market and decide whether or not that product can move forward. Uh, we do regulatory compliance to make sure that um, the, the cannabis is being cultivated and processed in an appropriate way. That's not going to create any adverse reactions uh, for consumers. Uh, we also do quite a bit of public health uh, messaging and, and, and campaigns to help you know, change and undo stigma related to cannabis and cannabis use, but also to make sure people know how to use uh, uh, properly, responsibly, keep, you know, products away from, from kids and pets, et cetera. Uh, we've launched now two of the largest public health education campaigns in the country related to cannabis. Uh, and what I'm most excited about, what we've just recently done, um, started to expand and make available uh, research opportunities here in the state. As you know, due to cannabis's federal uh, status as, as still um, illegal, um, there's not much research except uh, limited uh, research programs done through the Fed. And so uh, we're the first state to take that on head on to, to license uh, folks to do research. And so um, it's a lot engaged there from, uh, you know, compliance to, um, you know, public health and campaigns and external affairs. We are very public facing uh, agency. So we do a lot of 
organizing across the state to make sure people are aware of the opportunities that we're creating. Uh, so, you know, from a day to day, uh, you know, I do run uh, pretty significant programs, but I also have a large staff here to manage. Um, you know, we've got probably about 160 or so people across three offices across the state that I have to, uh, to manage and make sure they all get paid and are able to, you know, take time off when they got to go watch the kids mm-hmm. and all that stuff. So that's mm-hmm. also a part of it. Uh, I, I hope that wasn't too long winded. No, it was perfect. And, and you touched on a point. You said the stigmas around marijuana and education and public health. You touched on these points, right? So as you know, uh, as a black man, me as well, there's always been stigmas around marijuana in the black community, right? You have some people, I'll say different perspectives, right? You have some people who love it, can't live without it. But then you also have other people who don't necessarily have the same relationship, right? And a lot of this may be due to past drug laws, where we've seen it incarcerate, you know, family members, relatives, friends, uh, spouses, um, so on and so forth. In what ways are the agency looking to, one, acknowledge it, but two, kind of change the thought process and the perspective around marijuana for those who don't see it in a positive light within the black community who've been affected by it in an adverse way? Well, it starts with education. Um, You know, one of the things that I learned organizing around the state really on, on the issue was that a lot of, you know, particularly, you know, black elders had really negative um, uh, opinions of marijuana, not because the plant was bad, you know, many of them had used cannabis and marijuana previously, but it was because they knew that it would, you know, put the target on, on our backs. You know, it knew, they knew that the odor, uh, they knew that, um, you know, law enforcement would regularly use the, the odor of cannabis to, to go after um, uh, young people of color. And so part of what's really important and unique about the work that my office does uh, is that we don't run from that history. Uh, we don't run from the state's history with prohibition. In fact, we lean into it and we make sure that it guides our work today. Uh, just yesterday, we released um, uh, a map, essentially. It's a, it's a map that changes over time that identifies the communities that were hardest hit by prohibition um, and its enforcement. Right. And what you look as you track that map, you see all the black communities across uh, the state and you and you recognize that this is where the concentration of this activity happened. Um, And we use it to not only uh, prioritize certain people in the licensing process, uh, which is unique and something that New York State is doing that no other state has done, uh, but also will guide uh, where we give revenue out, because also unique in New York is that we have. Um, a significant amount of revenue that's going to go right back to communities who have been impacted um, because we understand that, you know, the effects of a cannabis arrest wasn't just, you know, jail time or whatever. It was also a loss of economic mobility um, uh, for an individual, but also uh, for a family. And so uh, something that we're really um, uh, proud of is that we don't run from that history. We lean into it and we let it guide our work. Now, how would people... You know, we often hear these organizations say, hey, you know, we want to definitely help people who've been on a marginalized end of, of these strict drug mm-hmm. laws or in just other spaces where, where people that are marginalized, hey, we're going to come help you. And oftentimes the help is there, but we don't always know how to tap into that help, right? Because yeah. it's not always yeah. marketed or broadcast in a way in which we, we, we find tasteful. So how do people um, find some of these opportunities uh, to tap into um, from a marijuana standpoint, and is there any opportunities, I think, for people who don't come from a lot of money to say, hey, I want to tap into this business or I want to tap into this work in a legal way? Absolutely. So I'm going to start with the licensing side. Um, you know, one thing that I would always say as we ran across the state and did this like public education tour around licensing opportunities is that this would not be an opportunity that people don't get because they didn't know. You know, I mean, oftentimes, like you said, government um, uh, will create these programs to help people, but they do such a poor job of bringing awareness to those programs. And so we had to start on the ground. We'd start with trusted validators, with organizations that are really doing the work in the community, and we partner with them. We host events with them. We add them to our mailing list and make sure that they are amplifiers of everything that we're doing. Uh, it has to be organic, and it has to be from the bottom up. Um, and that's something that actually has been really successful, not only in terms of attracting people to apply for licenses, which, you know, is the the core component of it, uh, but also in, you know, getting people engaged with government in a different kind of way. You know, there's a thing called a public comment period where uh, an agency will put out rules for whatever work they do, right? So uh, for us, uh, we put out regulations and we asked uh, the public to give us their feedback. 
uh, what I'm so proud of is because of how we've organized and because of how we've uh, elevated and, and, and made, a, 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 you know, made community participation a focus of our work, uh, we get more comments than any other agency in the state uh, because people are committed and engaged in the work that we're doing and because we've taken the time to educate. And so uh, that's something that we've done uh, that you know, a lot of other agencies are, 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 are trying to lean into for those particular programs that really you know, impact the broad uh, you know, swath of, of New Yorkers. I understand. And one of the things, I mean, how do, do you think that we'll ever really see true regulation? And, and what I say that by is, uh, for a lot of people that I knew growing up, buying marijuana, for example, was a lot like going to the barbershop, right? You go to the barbershop, you sit at the guy you get your hair cut from for the last 15 to 20 years. That's who you work with. He knows you. You know him. You don't even have to tell him what you want sometimes. You just sit in a chair. And yeah. I think buying marijuana is very synonymous with that, right? You knew a guy. You grew up with him, went to school with him. Yep. You've been working with him for years, right? And we talk about regulation, but how do you even change the culture of how people buy uh, marijuana? Well, what's happened across the country as we've uh, acknowledged the economic impact that the industry can have is that, you know, folks who have more resources, more capital, they've been able to buy up market share, right? And so, uh, uh, you know, this company A, um, you know, as whatever state legalizes or expands a medical program, whatever, uh, they end up being the place to go for marijuana, the, the M&M store for marijuana, right? And everybody comes to them and it's impersonal and uh, there's a disconnect between the product, the culture, and the people. Uh, what we've done differently is we're licensing your weed guy. We're giving him an opportunity. We're training him and teaching him how to run a compliant business. And then we're giving him the license to run it and the keys to the store. And so, you know, our hope uh, through our efforts, like, so for example, our first retail licensing program uh, was, again, something that nobody's ever done or tried to do. We made it a requirement that in order to be eligible for these initial retail licenses, not only were you supposed to be from certain communities, but you had to have a conviction uh, in order to be eligible. And so by doing that, what we were saying pretty outright was those who were impacted need to be able to run and participate here. Uh, but what we also found is a lot of folks who, you know, had either did time or, or had, you know, just previous convictions for marijuana offenses, you know, usually sale at a low uh, level, uh, went on to own and operate other businesses. And so they own and operate other because they had that, that business acumen. And now we gave them a chance to step back into something that they had previously done and to run uh, a, a marijuana business um, and, and to essentially close the circle and get that interpersonal, that communal sense of cannabis, like get it back into the business. And so it's actually proven really successful for the stores that we have open. Uh, we've got um, some other challenges that have kind of stalled our program right now. We've got some, some lawsuits, et cetera. Uh, but for the folks that we've been able to get open, uh, they're doing incredibly well, and they're doing well because they have a true connection to the community in which they serve and which they operate. And that's really the goal of the broader retail program. No, I, I definitely think connection is important. I think the next piece is, uh, to switch gears a little bit, obviously tech is amongst us, right? Do you see a future where big tech is more involved, right? Whether it be from delivering marijuana uh, whether it be from the Amazon stores being able to have it and being able to distribute it, uh, specifically in the state of New York, is there a place for technology and all this um, from the standpoint of either delivery or even selling, if you will? Well, there's definitely a space for big tech. We can't we can't ignore the future as it comes, and and uh, there's definitely a space for technology companies and innovators to support uh, the businesses that we're creating. But what will not happen? Uh, is, you know, you know, we're not uh, handing over the industry uh, to these companies to run. Uh, we are in being super intentional about ensuring that these small uh, family businesses really are the ones who, who lead in this space. They're going to be supported by technology through and through, and we've already seen some incredible uh, uh, um, innovation on that side. But, you know, for the most part, uh, it will be small businesses uh, in New York. That's our design. That's our structure. Um, they are, of course, uh, major tech companies trying to find their way in in other um, states and in other markets. But in New York, we're definitely a small business uh, focused uh, type uh, program that is supported by technology, not run by it. You know, that's, that's good to hear. So 
so one of the things you can't turn on the TV nowadays and not see it advertising talking about fentanyl, right? And when I look mm-hmm. at this, these regulations and hoping, you know, things get better and people kind of fall into line with the more legalized approach to purchasing marijuana, how has fentanyl kind of like affected what you do on a day to day? Um, do you see it, you know, causing any issues or restraints in what you do? And how, what problems or non-problems have it caused? Or has it actually helped you, right? Uh, because now we're having and seeing more responsible awareness around, you know, um, intake to substances. Well, before I, I stepped into this role, I mean, I did work on drug policy more broadly. And so I'm a big advocate for drug testing, uh, for people who use drugs. Um, you know, being able to test uh, those drugs is incredibly important. And I'm really uh, pleased that over the years the state has taken on uh, that position as well as someone who formerly advocated for those positions. Um, the truth is, uh, even though um, it is very clear that with a lot of the illicit products, and I, I got to clarify this because this is a, a kind of a big sticking point, um, the problem with continued illegal activity as it relates to marijuana sales is not that you know we're uh, concerned entirely about um, uh, you know people you know, dying, particularly from um, the illegal sales. Uh, what it is, though, is that the continued legal activity that is hyper-commercialized means that that local dealer, uh, that na- that friend, that relationship that existed doesn't exist anymore. Instead, we got, you know, illegal shops who are not focused on the individual consumer relationship. They're just trying to sell product to scale. And as they're trying to sell product to scale, they don't know where their product is coming from. And so whereas you might have had a friend grow some and then, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, would would distribute, Mm -hmm. now you've got folks getting boxes and shipments from the West Coast, from this place, that, and we don't know what is in uh, those products. And so I want to be precise when I talk about, you know, illicit sales uh, ongoing. I don't care about the corner boy. Mm -hmm. Uh, What we have a problem with is the... Uh, hyper commercialization of uh, illegal activity, uh, whereas where the folks who are engaging don't care about the consumer. Now, as it relates to contaminants, those products have been riddled with contaminants uh, uh, forever. And we we are we you know we've done reports. I've done a, a ton of public education and and had quite a few public statements about the fact that the products coming in through illicit market through these illicit storefronts are you know heavy metals salmonella like all sorts of weird stuff that people shouldn't be consuming i have not yet seen despite the reports that you know folks have been saying there's not yet been a case of cannabis laced with fentanyl that we have seen in the state right and so there's been a correction of the record still not good for you and you need to go to our legal stores for those in syracuse uh we've got a store downtown flintstone uh, operated by by a licensee by the name of Mike Flynn, that is a beautiful dispensary, and those products are legal. They're tested. They're safer for you, um, uh, you know. And so that's where we want folks to go. Uh, but I cannot say uh, that we've seen you know a whole bunch of people getting sick from fentanyl in either, obviously not in legal cannabis, but also not in the illicit product as well. Uh, that is just at this moment. I'm sure you know anything could happen, but at this moment we haven't seen that. Right. So and no, that's 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 good to hear. And obviously, New York is is pretty new to this this party of, of of cannabis management and regulation. So, what's some things that you've been able to learn legally, I guess, from you know the the states out west that have kind of been in this space a little bit longer? Well, I mean, you know, folks, uh, particularly on the advocacy side, like to dump on the other states um, because you know there's still so little uh, black and brown representation in the ownership. Um, but, you know, the truth of the matter is, is that, you know, we are just, you know, between us, California, Massachusetts, Illinois, you know, few states actually committed themselves to those broader equity goals. You know, Colorado and Washington, uh, they were just trying to sell wheat. You know, they didn't, they didn't really get the evolution didn't happen where they understood the need to atone for past policies. Now, uh, California and Massachusetts, they tried to kind of do these programs and get them off the ground, but they were working within an established uh, footprint that they couldn't fully roll back. Now, we have benefited from the fact that we had a very limited medical market. 
So there wasn't a whole bunch of existing operators that I had to claw away market space from. They didn't have a large footprint. We had, you know, 100,000 patients in the medical program, 10 operators they're producing at a small scale. So there's a huge market opportunity for everybody else, which means that our licensing programs could be more effective. Um, this, there's tons that we've learned in terms of just regulation in and of itself. Uh, but in terms of like ensuring that there's like diversity and inclusion uh, in the cannabis space, uh, we are the pioneer uh, in that. We are the ones uh, who are advancing the rules that everybody else is watching to see uh, what's going to happen in New York. And what I'm proud to say uh, as of now, uh, we already have uh, the most diverse cannabis industry in the country. Wow, that's, that's, that's great news to hear. Now, we want to thank you, Chris, for joining with us today. Um, super insightful, a lot of good information. Uh, for people who are more interested in cannabis and the regulations and the legal guidelines around it, where can they go to find additional information? Well, the best place, of course, is cannabis.ny.gov, which is our state website. There are a ton of resources there. Um, right now, as you go to that website, you'll see a lot about our, uh, our general application, which, again, is opened up today. We're encouraging everybody to apply for uh, cultivation, processing, retail, um, uh, and other licenses that are made available today. Um, on social, you can follow us at NYS underscore cannabis, NYS underscore cannabis on Twitter and Instagram. Thank you so much, Chris. And audience, thank you guys again for joining us for another episode of Culturally and Technically Legal, where we examine intersections of culture, law, technology. Hope you enjoyed this episode. Have a great one. Thank you.